Good evening. I just finished pushing firmware version 4 for the VASC and VASC will compile them now, so you should be able to uh, give it a try when I release this video. And the reason I jumped to version 4 in the firmware versioning numbers is that I have implemented a quite significant new feature for some applications. And that feature is high frequency direction. And essentially what it allows you to do is to track the motor position down to zero speed by injecting a signal into motor and uh, utilizing the fact that the inductance is uh, of the DNQ axis is position dependent. So let me show a short demo of this, or actually two demos. The first one is with uh, this motor here that has a pen tape to it and uh, this encoder here, I think I used it in a few videos a few years ago as well. But the difference this time is that uh, there is no position sensor on this one. It's only connected directly to the VASC. And it will determine the position down to zero speed by injecting signals to it. We will have some beeping in this motor. I don't know how it sounds in the camera, but in reality, I think it's uh, not as loud as uh, BLD says on low speed, but it can still be quite annoying. So let me plug it in. And now they should follow each other. Now it's not as smooth as an encoder, it kind of, uh, it almost feels like the motor is cogging a bit between the position, probably because we get some uh, non-linearity and I think we also cause some current offsets by injecting the signal. But even so, this is really impressive. Uh, with the same motor, we'll also show another demo. So. Let me bring Vascool to the front. Let's see, make this one always on top. And uh, let's align it somewhere. I will try to hold it like this. And uh, then I will go to duty cycling control and spin it and go back to position control. And see, even if you stop it in the middle, it didn't lose track of the motor at all. It tracked it perfectly all the time. Even if you do, let's see, this is probably dangerous. Yeah. So if I put it back here, it's exactly in the same position. Uh, interestingly as well, I didn't expect this, is that... Uh, um, I think if you go to this page, you can see it a bit better. If you go to uh, rotor position, make this one a bit smaller and set it to PID position, which will be the kind of uh, divided mode position. Now I wanted to mention here that uh, I run position control and this motor has 22 poles, so one electrical revolution will only be one eleventh of the mechanical revolution. So in PID controllers I set this po position angle division to 11 and uh, that essentially does multi-turn position control and had to tweak the parameters a bit. I didn't tweak them that much, but you can play around with that. And that makes uh, this division makes it go one mechanical revolution per position control revolution. And the output of that is what you see here. And uh, the interesting thing I wanted to show is that uh, even if we stop position control or stop injecting a signal and move it around a bit, now the server is tracking it all the time. And if you don't leave it still for too long, it will actually not lose track. So if you go back to position control, it will still not have lost track. It only loses track if we leave it like this for too long and allow it to drift too much. Oh, wrong button. Yeah, there we're back. And uh, it was quite a bit of work to get it working that well, but it works uh, much better than I ever expected. Uh, the next demo of this I wanted to show is um, my RC car. Let's see, it's still connected. I have another webcam up here that we can stream. So I have this um, PlayStation controller and I'm driving it around on the floor now. Now the interesting thing here, I will go into the details a bit later, but this one has an in-runner and uh, two pole in-runners in general. They don't have so much uh, saliency, we'll get into that. So they don't work for this, but it seems like every four pole in-runner that I had works quite well with high frequency injection. 
So this is a senseless castle creations motor. And uh, I can, I will hold my foot here. And if I give it full throttle solely, it will hear that it doesn't cog at all, even until it starts losing traction. And that's actually a lot of torque. Even if I block the wheels with my feet, it will, it will draw something like, I think I set the current limit to 80 amps in this one. It tracks it perfectly all the time. I can even push myself on the chair. And I'm not that light, so I can if it doesn't have. Yeah, that didn't work. But we can push the table a bit. And this is senseless, no cogging at all, so you could even use this setup for a rock crawler if you have a motor that has enough saliency. And that's really more than ever expected from this technique. I also tried it on my longboard and my mountain board. And uh, except the noise, I think it's more or less flawless. And it's not that noisy. Now, it doesn't work if you push too much current in the motor. So on this one, an 80 ounce is no problem, but on the longboard with the I think I have the 154 kV trumpet motors and I usually run them at like 50 amps or so and I can only push 40 amps in them before they start to lose track because they have uh, probably get into saturation a bit. Now that is how it performs and let me explain a bit how it works. Uh, maybe I didn't understand all of it completely but I think I have a pretty good idea about how it works and why it works. And I thought about this quite a bit for a while. So going back to this camera. Move this, move this a bit out of the way. And uh, let's see where I put it here. Here's a motor stator that is connected to my LCR meter. We'll switch on and it will measure inductance in this one. Uh, we are at, yeah, 221 micro Henry. Now, one property of an inductor is that if you hold uh, something with um, a permeability, or I think it's called permeability, different than air, in front of it, you can see the inductance will change. So even though this one has some NT, if, if I just take my side cutter and hold it on top here, we'll see that we go from uh, up to 230 micro Henry almost. If we remove it again, it will go back down. And this is only by holding it on one of quite many teeth here. So it is an effect that can be measured quite well. So moving my third camera into the capture area, we can have a look at the whiteboard. And essentially, if um, what is happening here is that uh, if you have a motor with the magnets up here and the stator teeth, uh, most of them, uh, they are not that flat or that symmetric around the stator teeth. So um, when they are aligned with the stator, you will have uh, some air gap here and you have some properties of the magnet. And when they're disaligned, you will have it differently. So you have an inductance that is dependent on the rotor position. And uh, I have some pictures here as well. They are about a different thing, but we'll get, get, get back to them shortly. Uh, before that, I realized I didn't prepare this. Uh, let me pause the video and look for some pictures. All right, so here's a photo of an uh, inrunner that I took apart. And this is a four pole inrunner. And as you can see on the rotor here is that um, you can clearly see where the magnets are when there are no magnets, and this causes uh, this difference in inductance as well. Because when you are aligned, you get uh, some properties, and when you disalign it, you get other properties. I also have a photo of a two pole in runner where this doesn't work. And this rotor kind of looks like a very, very flat, very even flat cylinder. 
And uh, if we look at the inductance difference here, there's like barely any at all. It's like so little that it just disappears in the noise. So on this motor it didn't work, but essentially every motor that was not a two-pole inrunner that I had here, it worked really well this technique. And uh, that was a happy surprise. So let's go and have a look at VESC tool. Now, if we go to the terminal and switch on high frequency plot, then we can go to real time data and experiment plot. And if I switch uh, set it into full break, means that I will do zero due to cycle output and motor. I will just grab it so I can move it a bit. You will see some samples here. And if I turn the motor slightly, you will see that it moves. And if I raise them, you can see that we have kind of moved a bit here. And that is what the signal looks like. And what to do here is that, uh, let's go back to the whiteboard. I was going to draw another picture on it to show how, how I do it, but I forgot about it. Let's see if this marker works. Uh, I think this one works. So essentially, if you look at the space vector modulation diagram, um, what to do is uh, I put on the alpha and beta frame in the FOC control, I output the voltage vector first in this direction at some amplitude and then this direction at some amplitude. And then I measure the current here and here and take the difference of the currents and put that in the vector. Then I turn it a bit and do the same thing again and turn it a bit and do the same thing again. And then I do this for either 8, 16 or 32 different position in the revolution. And uh, the current differences here are what you can see down here in blue. And if you take the current difference and uh, take the um, resistance into account, you can actually, and uh, the time and the voltage into account, you can figure out what the inductance is. So what we do when we do this, I put this in a vector and calculate the inductance for all different positions of the motor. And then you get this kind of graph. Now, one problem that you might see here, and uh, that this, uh, yeah, maybe comes to mind, is that if you look at the magnets, let me move on to the camera again, you see this on the way from here as well, is if you look at the magnets in the stator, is that you have a south pole and then a north pole and then a south pole. And if you're aligned here, you cannot really tell if you have a north pole or a south pole based on this thing because uh, it looks the same. So what happens in this graph is that for one, this is one uh, electrical revolution. We have the sine wave that actually goes around twice per electrical revolution. And that means we have an ambiguity that can be plus or minus 180 degrees. So we can solve this ambiguity too, luckily. And in order to do that, we take advantage of a different property of an electromagnet that has an uh, iron core and not an air core. So if you look at the magnet here, my drawing of electromagnet, uh, if you put a voltage here, a voltage, uh, um, what is called a voltage step, and look at the current, the current will start to rise slowly in a linear fashion. And the reason it doesn't rise quickly is that you have some inductance here, and the less inductance you have, the quicker it will rise. But the thing is that uh, as the current rises, you will um, kind of charge this one with energy. And at some point, I usually imagine it as a spring, at some point it will not, it will become saturated. And when that happens, you will see that the current rises faster and uh, then, you, then you're not linear anymore. And this uh, transition is a lot of time quite steep, so it's hard to detect. Now, one interesting thing here is that where that happens uh, depends on if you have a south or a north pole of magnet here, north or south pole. So if you have, if you bias the magnetic field in this one with the magnet, with say a north pole, then it will this transition will will happen at some point. And if you turn the magnet around and you have the south pole here, then you bias the thing in another direction, 
and then this transition will happen at a different time because you have uh, first you have to overcome the difference in uh, that the magnet causes in flux in the core and then you have to add your current flux to it and based on this property you could distinguish if you have a north or south pole here so what you have to do there then is you have to drive this one to sufficiently high current for this effect to start to appear and if you look at this diagram here when you do the voltage pulses what will happen is that if you are in the linear region when it goes uh, when you have the current when it bias it like this and actually the graph will continue like this on the other side and then it will be interchanged here so if you go in the voltage like this and like this and you are in the linear region the sum will kind of be zero and if you start to go into the saturation region depending on if you have a north pole south pole here we'll get some bias here and let me try to demonstrate that so in this case, if we go to the uh, high frequency injection set settings, we see that uh, we usually run at two volts, two volts when we run this thing uh, between two and three volts, three volts at higher currents because then we get a bit more uh, signal to noise ratio, but uh, then it sounds a bit more and weights a bit more power. But let me increase this one to say 10 volts and do the same thing again with the graph in the same position. And it might not be that easy to see, uh, but it's not really symmetric anymore. It's a bit more e easier to see here. So you can see that this side has a bit more current here than this side. And this means that uh, you kind of get a one revolution sine wave that is overlaid with this. And this you can take advantage of. So the way the high frequency injection works on the VASC is that uh, you have a few parameters. You have this one, the start voltage that you run for a couple of samples in the beginning, if you haven't been run it before, at higher voltage. And then you look into the saturation and take advantage of that to figure out where it is initially. And then you go to those lower voltages and then you track it with 180 degrees ambiguity, but it will make sure that you don't get any big jumps. And then you can keep tracking it with higher signal to noise ratio. Now, the interesting thing, uh, before I go get more technical, I want to mention that uh, if you want to give this a try, uh, you can play around with these parameters. There are some default values, and in the future, I might even make a wizard that kind of sets them for you. But for now, you kind of have to tweak them manually and see what works for motors. What I experienced is that if, we ha if you have an in-runner, like the one in Hadmin Asakar, then uh, the run and max voltage, this should be, should be quite similar and low, maybe between 2 and 4 volts. And if you have a like a common outlonger and like the Trampa outrunners on the longboards, then you usually set this one between three and ten volts and the start voltage a bit higher. I think on the Trampa motors you usually set it to 20 volts or so. It depends on the inductance of the motor and how much current you need to saturate it. So uh, going back to this graph, uh, what you want to know here, and this is quite interesting. Uh, how you can extract this information. So what do you want to know here? You want to know you have this sine wave that makes two revolutions uh, across this thing. You have um, another sine wave that makes one revolution across the electrical revolution and then you have some DC offset as well. And you want to know the amplitude and the phase, especially the phase of the sine waves. And to find uh, a sine wave within uh, a signal uh, the Fourier transform is quite useful. So if you take a discrete Fourier transform of this signal, then the first bin will represent the DC value, which is, which is kind of the average, or the zeroth bin. The first bin then will des the define this, describe this uh, sine wave from the saturation, and the next bin will describe this sine wave that goes twice here. And uh, if you take the uh, phase of the Fourier transform, you get the phase, I mean the arc tangent of the magnitudes and if you take the magnitude you get the magnitude obviously and the cool thing here is that uh, if you take the fa if you take the first bin then you get the inductance of the motor because that's the DC value if you take the average of the third bin then you get the difference between the L and D axis inductance and uh, those measurements since I made it uh, 
I spent quite a bit of time on getting this right because it's critical. It turns out that this was much more accurate than the old inductance measurement technique. So I have thrown, thrown that out and using uses, use this one now for inductance measurement. And the result is that it's faster, it's much more quiet, and much more accurate. And you also get the difference in D and Q axis inductance, which you can use later for MTPA, maximum torque per amp, or even you can figure out some things about field weakening if you have this data. So going back to the terminal, well, I'm here I can also show this uh, what inductance measurement sounds like. I don't know if you, can, if you can hear it in microphone now because it's relatively quiet. Uh, this one, let's say, is zero point one, and you see that we have uh, fifty microhenry, and they have almost four microhenry in difference in the. D and Q axis inductance, and even if we do it, it's like 0 0.5 or this much, you, um, you get more or less the same values, even though we had a like tenfold difference in magnitude now of the current. So this was a positive surprise. But the thing I wanted to show you is the result of the FFTs. So go back to this plot and uh, do auto scaling. And run again. Uh, this is with the higher voltage, I think. Uh, let's write back this one. And as you can see here, the blue value is kind of the phase that we track by looking at the difference in, uh, well, at the difference in D and Q axis inductance, the thing that does not depend on saturation, and it tracks the motor quite well. But uh, the red one is the thing we get from this uh, from the saturation, and you see at this low amplitude, it's just noise because we don't get any saturation. We are, if you look at the graph here, we are well within this linear region, and then we can really tell much from this. But if we stop the injection and go back to the higher voltage, let's say 10 volts, I think 8 volts is probably enough. Look at this graph again. Look what happens to the red one. I think I think it was better lower actually. This mo this particular motor, this uh, KD direct motor, seems to be quite sensitive on how much is up here. But most other motors, they are, they accept quite wide ranges. So now you can see that we have uh, limited noise. We can also see here we set it higher. Then we got less noise, but we they differ a bit for some reason, uh, probably because we get, uh, I don't know why they differ, I have to look into that. It doesn't do that in other motors, but we, here we have a bit more noise and we can see that uh, they track each other almost perfectly at this higher amplitude. When I saw this, uh, that was a, quite a good surprise that this, uh, uh, this uh, the first bin of the FFT or the second bin, the one that has one hole um, revolution of the sine wave uh, tracks so well. I thought that yeah, maybe we can even use this for uh, non-salient motors that are even. But as it turns out, when you run current in the motor, you start to you do the same thing as you do with the magnet, and then this one gets disaligned quite a bit. So it's not that easy, at least, because you probably have to take uh, compensate for the current you put in. But um, yeah, maybe some future update. But that's what it looks like. Either way, and we can also plot. Um, let's see, yeah, this one graph four, which is uh, the difference from the saturation current, and you get some magnitude here. And if we decrease the magnitude here again to what we had before, and you make it noisier, then you will see that this green one will be much lower. Almost looks the same, but it's like mostly noise here, and that's also what you see. Uh, we can also plot, uh, let's see, this one, uh, the average inductance, and uh, this one, that is the difference between the L and Q inductance. And if I switch to keyboard control, or run some duty cycling motor and even turn it, you see, now the motor is running, but uh, the inductance measurements, they are with some filtering, they are almost independent of the motor turning slowly, which is really interesting. 
So this is really a major improvement in the inductive measurement from before. So I think uh, that's what I had for today in this update. So I have high frequency ejection that goes down to zero speed for a lot of motors. You have to do some tweaking, but often it's only, yeah, I can also hold this, often it's only to go to sensor mode and setting to it to high HFI and then it will work. And if it doesn't work properly, you can play around a bit with the settings here. And you can also, if you want to figure out quickly if it has a chance of working with the motor, you can go to the terminal and you can do um, the inductance measurement here. And this will, if you see a significant difference between the inductance and the DLQ difference, or if this one, rather if this one is high enough, then this has a good chance of working. If this one is really low compared to this one, then it's probably not going to work. And you can also switch on the plot options here and they go to experiment plot and look closer into what is going on with the motor. And uh, yeah, that's the HFI, better reductive measurement. And uh, that's it for this update.